So, colleagues, what you were asked to think about as an adult is what prior knowledge would you need to bring to whichever one of those texts that you actually read in order to comprehend it, in order to get the best from that text and to be able to answer questions upon it. What might a year six people struggle to comprehend in the passage that you read? And what knowledge can be acquired through schooling in your school that would have helped more 11-year-olds to have comprehended the text? Let's have a look what you came up with. So much in The Lost Queen was dependent upon historical knowledge. Many of the concepts there are dependent upon children having been taught, for example, what struggle for the throne means. It doesn't mean who rushes into the toilet first thing in the morning, <laughs> what arguments you have about how long people spend in the bathroom. But if you haven't been taught what struggle for the throne means, if you don't have that vocabulary, you will indeed struggle with this text. Rival families, family symbols, ancestors, ancestry, all concepts, vocabulary actually, within the history national curriculum, if it's taught well. The way of the dodo, first sighted, Distinct predators, science key stage two, paradise. Do all your 11-year-olds know what paradise is? Do your 13-year-olds or your 16-year-olds? What conversations have you had in RE where you've considered alongside either your diocesan syllabus or the agreed syllabus what knowledge pupils need to have to engage with questions of faith and spirituality, for example. It's important, colleagues, to remember that in research, poor readers outperform good readers when the poor readers know more about the subject matter. And then knowledge of the topic trumps text complexity. Knowledge. Knowledge of the topic also trumps average reading ability and IQ as an indicator of likely reading success and the ability to comprehend. The task illustrates a problem quite often seen at Key Stage 2, often before, where we're focusing curriculum time solely on comprehension strategies because there's a test at the end of the year. What research shows us is studying a range of literature, learning the wider curriculum is much more important for comprehension, much more important. And at times, these have been sidelined, as we know, with the best of intentions to try and get children through a test. There is strong evidence that comprehension strategies are extremely useful but they're very limited in their impact compared with having the knowledge to understand the text. It's the absolute key message from this. So, Carl. Thank you. I, I keep it for the next one. So. Oh, OK, thanks. Um, so as Bradley has, has talked about, what we know it allows us to, um, to read, to move on, to understand, but it's that prior knowledge to comprehend that new material and how we're able to, it supports our capacity for metaphor, for schema, for um, uh, concept development, how we uh, infer and that interconnectedness. So when we, when we see what is potentially new or unfamiliar material, um, it's more likely, we're more likely to understand it and comprehend it if it's been related to what we've already um, uh, learnt before or what we already know. It's the point here that I want to make as we move into the next session about the transferability, that knowledge is highly transferable between, con between, between contexts. And as you'll have seen from um, The Lost Queen and the Dodo, um, what the primary history and the primary science curriculum, uh, the work that could be done there in terms of that transferring uh, knowledge and, and building uh, comprehension. 
So let's take this on and consider a school that decides to add uh, the Romans to the curriculum. So if you have a look, um, in a moment we're going to move to, uh, to page 7 in your booklet, but let's just think about um, examples where we've seen um, a, a topic is covered on the curriculum and we, we've, we've seen that not much has been learnt for, uh, from that topic, from the activities chosen. By contra contrast, we've been in places where we've carefully con we can see that school and school leaders, the teachers, have carefully considered, reviewed, they've refined the what needs to be taught so that pupils make that progress. The structure, the narrative of the curriculum, um, is intrinsically linked with that progress that good progress is dependent on that, i.e. what is it that you as teachers and leaders choose to emphasise in terms of building knowledge, layering knowledge and the transferability. So let's take, for example, um, a, a primary teacher could choose to, to teach the Romans um, through a series of engaging activities. Um, they could get the children to, uh, to dress up, um, to, uh, to, to use costume, uh, to, uh, to link to armour, etc., just to get a, a feel for, for what things are like. They could um, be involved, children could be involved in baking a Roman recipe, again, to, uh, to, to look at how uh, people lived and, and what they uh, ate at the time. Um, they could then go on and write an imaginative story about how they would have felt if they were a Roman soldier uh, missing home. And all that is, is all well and good. But within that planning, within that content, within that structure and narrative, what about the conversation? Certainly when I'm having um, a professional dialogue with middle leaders, with teachers in schools, uh, we want to, to unpick what is it about that intent? What is it that you want them to know? What is it they want them to take forward? Particularly if we think about the arc of time and where, you know, as history moves on, um, it's not just where they'll encounter some of these things um, in, uh, just in history alone, but also some of these concepts in other ideas. So thinking about that transferable knowledge, it's a really good way for us to open that debate and discuss what it is that we want to see. So, a well-designed curriculum might stress the following concepts. Because it's not just about the benefits in history, it's about what we might take from this as they move through the school curriculum. So when pupils revisit that, revisit this um, when they move into secondary school and let's say for example we're studying the English Civil War but we're starting to to layer that knowledge make that association that connection between what we mean by republic what we mean by social class their understanding of taxes and what what they um, uh, why they're asked for why they become a point of contention it might be also in terms of what we understand by rebellion and how rebellion takes many different shapes and many different forms and again, these are things that, that one would come and, uh, and, and visit on many different occasions, both within the history curriculum but elsewhere. Some of the other concepts that are in there in terms of, that, that link to other subjects, peninsula, climate, trade, empire. But not just that, there's also, as, as Bradley's talked about, the importance of vocabulary. How I might, um, and how vocabulary is used uh, metaphorically in literature, but if we take something here such as sacrifice, not a particularly um, uh, nice area to, to be discussing um, during the morning, but if we take of, of how we might um, look at that in terms of, of studying the Romans and, and, and Roman history, and then in its, in its literal sense, then that also helps us with our understanding when we come across it metaphorically um, in literature. And we've deliberately used the terms concepts here as well, because it's about the key is in order to make those rich that rich network of associations uh, to help that 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 process in it's about deepening understanding and we're able to see the utility in different situations in different contexts so we learn the meaning of these words in the rich context where they are used so when we such as the dodo and the lost queen we faced it um, we're given an unfamiliarity an unfamiliar uh, text or area we're able to draw on what we previously know to, to help us work our way through that, rather than just using um, dictionary definitions. Each time we encounter, we deepen that knowledge, we layer that understanding. 
So to build on Carl's point, context is all. It gives meaning to words. The greater the range of contexts, the more flexible a child's understanding will be. We need to make sure that we do provide experiences for children that enable them to learn the vocabulary, to actually get the knowledge under their belts that we want them and need them to have as they move through school. Um, words that have just come up, they're all uh, taken from the dodo passage and just pause for a moment to look at all the science knowledge there. It's all in the key stage two national curriculum for science. And it just builds on Carl's point that <coughs> the vocabulary you learn in individual subjects is then used in a very cross-curricular way. It rather puts the lie to, you're going to do better in the English reading test if you keep practicing comprehension, because actually you're not going to do well in the English reading test if you don't actually have a rich vocabulary. A rich vocabulary that fundamentally is the right, if you believe in the national curriculum, of every 11-year-old to, to have acquired. Comprehension is understanding. Um, you need it in order that you can access the documents, the papers, the computer screen, and take part in our society. And that's why the curriculum and the building of knowledge within the curriculum is so essential. We talked before about uh, a broad um, definition of knowledge. We talked about know how and know what. And I've also, um, I also mentioned the work that we're doing with our Ofsted inspectors in, in terms of talking about that, that common language, that frame of reference. And particularly when we're, we're, we're considering, we're talking with school leaders about content, about selection, about sequencing, that whole structure and narrative. And here you'll see um, uh, an example of how that know what and know how comes together. Now for the purposes of, of work, working with our inspectors, we've called the building blocks of prior knowledge, the components, and, and, and how those components come together to enable the complex task or performance or activity or skill. And we've called that the composite, okay? How they come together to, uh, to enable um, the skill to be developed or, or whether it's a, a performance or a task. And if we look at this example in terms of learning to paint with colour, and if we take the, um, uh, the box uh, the component on the, on the far left hand side in terms of understanding colour theory, complementary colours, colour mixing, how we would then, how one would then use that in terms of, of, of understanding and developing skin tone to mix the correct colours to get the correct skin tone, which in turn enables us to move towards that, that composite activity. It may be, for example, um, it's a portrait, so it's really, uh, it, it's key that, that skin tone um, is used uh, well there. We find the, um, this particular language, the way of making uh, reference to these, it helps us in discussion, either with inspectors, with the school leaders, because we're talking about why is it you choose what you want to happen, what, when choosing that what, and how with teachers, those components are coming together, those building blocks, and what is it moving towards? It allows us to bring that know-how and know what together. So that content and sequencing over time, we're able to really build that in through the components and where it moves to. And if we think about accuracy and fluency and independence and the ability to transfer and, and, and generalize, they're important, but they're also difficult elements of learning, particularly for children and young people who've got special educational needs and or disabilities. And, and, and what we often see is the same tact task in a different context or with reduced support can be highly highly challenging. The useful terms that we use here is when, when discussing that creation of what does a high quality curriculum look like and how is it that you build 
um, in order to enable pupil to move, pupils to move through it smoothly, regardless of ability, background or starting point. Thank you. So um, we've been talking about why a focus on curriculum is necessary. And in the last series of slides shared by Bradley and Carl, um, that has been exploring in particular the way that knowledge allows comprehension. And of course, I hope it become, it's become clear as well that by um, that we could use the word comprehension, but there is a synonym, synonym, understanding. And of course, it's the case that what you know already is very significant in how able you're going to be to learn something more. So we've been looking at, at that particular reason why we need to focus on curriculum. We'll do so for a bit longer and then explore some other areas too. So um, we've been discussing how pupils acquire knowledge, um, but there's, we can sort of flip this on its head. And so rather than saying, what is it that children need to know over time, we can ask, why is it that they can't do what you could call that composite skillful performance or task? What are the gaps? What is it that's missing? And of course, that's curricular thinking too, working back, trying to diagnose what's missing. And the Jenga Tower is a really useful way of thinking about that. Because what happens over time is that those gaps build up um, and they increasingly hinder a child's capacity to understand and remember new material. And so we can see that, that that can be quite evident in a subject like maths, where, for example, a child might be trying to um, add together mixed numbers and um, their lack of facility in basic addition, multiplication, means that although they have understood the method they've been taught and kind of what's going on, it all breaks down because they just don't have security in those components, those building blocks. Um, and that, that can be quite evident in something like maths, and it becomes evident what it is that's missing, what those gaps are. And of course, successful curricular thinking will involve diagnosing those gaps, remediating them. Um, but, uh, but hopefully, um, the, the, the Carl's talk about the Romans has illustrated that it's not actually just in subject like, subjects like maths that these gaps exist. They're just more evident. But actually, if we think about reading comprehension, uh, what were the gaps? What were the components? What was the knowledge that was missing that meant children couldn't comprehend those passages? Um, as, as, they, as they move on with a history curriculum and might be taught at secondary, what concepts that might have been learnt at primary perhaps hadn't been learnt, which meant that those children are now going to find it harder in their subsequent history learning. So thinking about components in terms of what's missing is constructive as well as thinking about what needs to build in the future. So we've been talking about knowledge as vocabulary. And of course, um, vocabulary knowledge is actually absolutely crucial. But it, hopefully, we haven't been giving a message that children need to go away and get out their dictionaries and learn off um, definitions in their dictionaries. Because of course, it's uh, what gives vocabulary its meaning. What gives vocabulary its meaning is the rich context in which it's learned. And then the more context in which that vocabulary is encountered, or that idea, the more meaning there will be. Um, and so when we're thinking about knowledge, we're thinking about vocabulary, but we're also thinking about concepts. And all that sort of rich context, events, people, places. And of course, um, we're talking about um, knowledge in its very broadest sense. So we're talking about know that but also know how, what could be called skills, and we'll explore that in a little bit more detail. Um, and one other thing that is interesting to note is that it's very clear that we're talking about something that builds over time here. If a concept of learning is based on what you see in an individual lesson, there was learning in that lesson, what you're observing is perhaps the most very fragile beginnings of understanding that have not been yet committed to long-term memory. And of course, progress is over time, over a sequence of lessons, over terms, over years. And so thinking about that learning as in an individual lesson is not very helpful 
compared with thinking about that building and accumulating over time. So it should be evident that when it comes to curriculum, it isn't the case that anything goes, or that Ofsted could consider that any curriculum structure or content <coughs> is fine. Because obviously, if we're thinking about those, um, those composite, we've used that term composite, complex, skillful <coughs> tasks and performances that schools aspire that their children should be able to complete or are required um, if we're thinking about those, there are prior building blocks which are ne necessary for them to be able to complete those. Um, but having said that, um, it's really important that schools do have as much flexibility as possible in thinking about their own um, structures and content in their curriculum. Generally, that, that, that doesn't have to be very controversial because, of course, things like um, the letter sound correspondence, mm, um, that's not very controversial. Um, full stops, osmosis, French verbs, not especially controversial um, in terms of those being in the content of a curriculum. But, this, but in, in some areas, there is more controversy. For example, history or English literature and the books that are chosen. And um, Ofsted do not have, obviously, a specific view um, in these areas, but we would expect to see real thought and care um, given to what is chosen and consideration. Okay. We keep using the word knowledge, and um, we're going to explore in a bit more detail what we mean by that in a moment. But... Does that mean that Ofsted have suddenly switched and are, are sort of, you know, forgotten about the importance of complex, um, skillful performances that children uh, might be learning and actually are advocating that um, uh, children's minds are rammed with random pieces of disconnected rote information? Definitely and absolutely not. Um, and the, 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 the fact is that actually that analogy for a child's mind or for anyone's mind for human cognition as like a sort of bucket that can be filled with random pieces of information isn't correct. We know from decades of research that's not how human cognition works. That actually children make connections between um, what, they've what they're now learning and what is known prior. And so that bucket analogy isn't helpful. And in fact, it's more helpful, a better analogy, is to think of a mind and what is learnt in the mind as like a complex web of information. Um, pieces, uh, pieces of information, lots of knowledge about a particular area and about the connections between different pieces of knowledge. Um, and, and this web has a term, is, is known in psychology, and I know many of you will know this term, in the singular it could be called a schema, and in the plural that's a schemata but we can just say a sort of complex web. So if we think about what that means in practice, a young child encountering a word like river, or a slightly older child perhaps beginning to uh, notice and encounter a word like government in their teaching or, in, or as they are in the world around them, um, each time they encounter that word, it gains more meaning for them and they learn more about the interconnections between that idea and other ideas, which builds up this complex web of what we could call knowledge, but knowledge in its broadest sense. Um, and it is something that's interconnected. And of course, good teaching is about making useful connections which aren't misapprehensions. So, this repeated use of the word knowledge is not about rote. Neither is it in any way down playing the importance of children understanding what they've learned. And I hope through what we've said so far that should be very clear because everything that we've talked about knowledge is about how that knowledge needs to be rooted in contexts that give that knowledge real meaning. Um, and of course, it's actually just unhelpful to think about progress in knowledge and progress in understanding as entirely separate things because... Um, the more you know about something, 
and know about the connections between related pieces of knowledge, the deeper your understanding. Increasing knowledge of related content is deeper <coughs> understanding. If we think about that schema of um, pieces of, of knowledge and the interconnections before, between them. Okay. Or oh, is it gone? We've discussed this um, uh, as we've gone through, that, that knowledge being uh, sticky, being generative. The more you know, the greater your capacity to learn. Um, we know it is the multiplicative effect. Um, that ability to take that new learning and, and draw on what we, that prior knowledge in order to give us that, that, that surety to provide that space in the working memory to be able to, to process. And if we then move in and look at, I'll just give you a, a few minutes to read um, that quote. How as new learners, sorry, how as learners were able to, the, the ease in which using that prior knowledge, we can assimilate new and unfamiliar knowledge more effectively, more efficiently. Um, and there are times that that short term memory can be quickly overwhelmed by too much unfamiliar material. For me, um, it's the analogy of carrying a large pile of washing um, downstairs, as I'm wont to do. And um, so I'll have my washing and suddenly a sock falls out. So I'll bend down to try and grab that sock. And then as I bring it in, all of a sudden um, uh, another falls out. And just as I manage to bring that one back in, the T-shirt that I'm carrying on the top falls off. And when one um, working memory is overloaded, there's that, there's that element, isn't there, of, uh, of a feeling that one is losing control. There's too much to hold in all at once. And literally um, I can feel um, uh, when that happens the thoughts dropping um, from my head at that time so again that's why we need to consider how that prior knowledge is already giving us that 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 rock bed that those building blocks with which we can go on and, and assimilate uh, new knowledge more efficiently and more effectively While we've not discussed skills in isolation, um, I need to, to really um, stress this. This is not because Ofsted doesn't place a priority on children becoming skillful. Uh, far from it. Throughout, we've, we've talked about the relationship between knowledge and skills, the know what, the know how. We've talked about the components, the building blocks, and how they come together um, to, uh, to create a a uh, composite performance, a task, an activity, a skill, whether it's um, being able to, uh, to, to paint a portrait or to paint effectively with colour or to write a history essay or to demonstrate uh, understanding and application of skills uh, in a peer lesson in a small-sided game. What we are going to use, though, for the purpose of this session is the following dictionary type, this working definition of... of of cognitive skill as a capacity to perform drawing on what is known. The know-how in applying the known, in applying the skill. And that's our frame of reference. Because in education, we're interested in the curricular question of what. How do we build these specific, desirable, skillful um, capacities, whether they be of analysis, of evaluation, of problem solving, creativity, independence, how we move from those components to the composite. And, and what research tells us is that our experience in a particular subject or a particular domain helps us see where problems may be analogous to what we've seen before. So, for example, where we've encountered them. We talked about uh, the memory is, is not just that repository for facts, but uh, problems that we've solved reside there, the complex ideas that we've been able to tease out the conclusions that we have drawn, that's all part of the, uh, the knowledge and the memory that we use uh, in order to, uh, to develop. So, when we talk about knowledge and skills, 
Is it a false binary here? So we can see proceeding down the, the different pathways that we progress in skills um, and separately progress in knowledge as outlined in this slide. Actually, the aim of this session is to talk about this false binary, that this, the skill being that capacity to draw on what's known, the, the know-how in applying the known, the knowledge and skills are intrinsically linked. Skill is a performance built on what a person knows, built on that prior knowledge. And whether that's physical or cognitive performance skills, um, we can't separate them from the knowledge. You need to draw on something in order to do something else. So that knowledge and the capacity it provides to apply the skills and deepen understanding, they're the essential ingredients of, of curriculum design. And it's that kind of, uh, uh, of debate and discussion that we want to have when we come to, uh, to, talk, to talk to you in schools. Thank you. Oh, sorry, it's one more from me. <laughs> so, just to illustrate that point, sorry, my fault. Um, let's consider a problem where you need to apply some, some critical thinking. So, uh, I'm going to give you... Uh, it's, a, it's a research experiment and um, it was given to uh, American and um, Chinese college students. So I just want to read the problem and, and, and think of a solution. I'm going to give you uh, four minutes. Thank you.